what we're, we're going to talk about is essentially linking black lives and black minds, and what we're going to do is explore some patterns in policing and in schooling. So this is um, a picture of Walter Scott. Walter Scott was an African-American male. He is an African-American male. I guess you don't stop being one. Um, but he, his life was taken at the hands of law enforcement. You may have seen um, the video of it with uh, My Michael Slager, who was a police officer who basically um, killed him. And I think it, what, we're, what I'm trying to do really is just paint this picture that we can't talk about black minds if, we can't, if we're not valuing black lives. Black lives and black minds are inextricably intertwined. For one does not value the life, and they certainly cannot value the mind. Now, in this presentation, there's going to be some videos of things that are hard to watch. So if um, I'll let you know as they come up, but, um, and I'll basically give a trigger warning. This is, this is a trigger warning right now, OK? So if anyone feels like, you know what? I, don't, I feel like I got my feel for the night, and I feel like I want to take off, now would be the time to do so. Um, and then, you know, don't worry about it. Or as I say them, as they come up, if you want to step out or, or kind of put your head down, that's cool as well. Um, it's tough because I, I have a different, like there's two different sides of me. Like one side of me is, well, our experience shouldn't be somebody's trigger warning, right? But at the same time, so many of us have experienced these challenges that it, it is important to essentially recognize that as well. Um, I'm just even thinking about in doing this class in, in, in talking with my twin brother, uh, it wasn't but a, a couple months ago that he was pulled over in, in Sacramento and he uh, was pulled over for nothing, which happens a lot, driving while black or driving while bright. <laughs> it's called spade a spade, all right? <laughs> But for real, and cops came up to his car, gun drawn, right? He was terrified, absolutely terrified. Hands on the steering wheel, right? Don't move your hands or else you're gonna be, or else you can be worried about what comes afterwards. Told him to roll down his window, so he rolls down his window, puts his hand back on the steering wheel, and the cop says to him, so um, what are you doing in this neighborhood? And he says, well, I'm on my way to see one of my employees. Now, remember, the cop has his gun drawn. And then he says to him, well, what is it that you do that you would have employees? Right? And when he would call me to tell me about this, it, it brought back so many different experiences that I've had. And we know that from the work that we do, that, that this is a pattern that faces all people of color. In, in particular, I think one group, of course, is, is black men. And it, it's something that, that is a reality that we have to recognize also takes place in school settings. So here's a video, if you can play it, of just one example of what this looks like after a very simple officer, police stop. Um, officer Michael Slager said that he feared for his life because the man took his stun, stun gun in a scuffle. And uh, was in was essentially feared for his life that this man would get the best of him at that point we're going to show you the video and what the video shows is something very different you see the scuffle you see the here man, right here you see the man being tased you see the man being shot that's a total of eight shots he goes down the traffic stop presumably took place somewhere Before nearby this. Now, this is a bystander who took this video um, at this point, a second officer comes on the scene. Um, he is handcuffed. Uh, right before this, um, in an earlier clip, I did see the officer appeared to drop the stun gun by. So what you see there in, in that clip is essentially a blatant disregard for life. He was pulled over for a minor traffic violation for doing so. But how many times did things like this occur that we would never know? So we are dealing, I believe, with a life and death situation. We say names such as Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Eric Garner, Oscar Grant III. Those represent essentially the, the, the worst case scenario. There are thousands of Trayvons 
thousands of Michaels and thousands of Eric's in our classrooms every day. And it's only when we can begin to think about our roles as basically be intertwined with that that we can really try to move this agenda forward. Now, Tyrone Howard, who you has referenced a lot in the conversation with, with Ryan, is one of the most prolific scholars on black males in education. And he wrote a piece that's one of the required readings for today. Does anybody know the title of the piece? Yes, why black lives and black minds matter. And so he was one of the first people to say, you know, we have to make a clear linkage between these things. And so he says it's important for us to do so because it's a response to persistent and seemingly unchanging data. And we know what that data looked like. You saw some of the information that was presented by Ryan. You've seen things in terms of what you've read with the course readings. The experience of being a black learner in a classroom is not the same experience as it is for being a learner of who is white or of a majority background. And in, in, in thinking about that, we also have to recognize that we, we do so in the spirit, in terms of linking these things, of engaging in actions that help to reclaim humanity and dignity. And if, if you noticed in the intro for this class, we talked about the importance of extolling the morality and dignity of black minds, because we know that in general, we're talking about black boys and men. They're viewed at best as being amoral, but most often is viewed, viewed as being immoral. And as a result, then, there is this license to engage them in certain ways. He says that we also have to do so because it's become increasingly evident that there's a brazen indifference, direct violence, scrutiny, and criminalization of black boys that has become so pervasive that it's normalized. Now, from a critical race theory perspective, when we say the word normal, right, we recognize that it's a daily occurrence. And normal doesn't mean good or bad, it's normal. It's a regular experience. And this has, of course, become worse under zero tolerance policies, which we'll talk about. And so he's talked about how if we look in society and we look at how black communities and black people are policed, we can see very similar patterns in terms of the criminalization that takes place in our classrooms. And remember that quote that I said, hey, remember this quote um, from, from Patrice, right? Here's a similar quote from Tyrone where he says that basically criminalizi criminalizing uh, black students in learning sp uh, spaces, that's what's taking place. And we can see that in a few different ways. We see that in many schools now that have metal detectors as students walk into the building. Police officers who roam the hallways school resource officers, private security guards, surveillance systems, randomized <coughs> checks for drugs, illicit materials, that have basically turned our schools into the same thing that we see in society. And so what we want to do here is basically start to think about how the, the root of all of this is really supremacy, it's racism, it's discrimination, and dehumanization, which I'll talk about in a moment here, and it leads to two different patterns. The undervaluing of black lives, the undervaluing of black minds, and criminalization of black lives and the criminalization of black minds. And so you can see on that those trees that bear what is the kind of fruit is borne by this? It's use of deadly force, maintenance order policing, exclusionary discipline, in-school tracking. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at this chart here. And this is what what I want us to do is to start to really be thoughtful about how do these same patterns play out. So in general, right, when we think about how black males are engaged by society and then, of course, by law enforcement or by educators, it falls into basically three different categories. One, there's an, some sort of assumed appearance that they're, they're soon to be different in a very negative way. And then as a result, there is then aggressive policing, aggressive policies to essentially reel in that, that assumed behavior. And then that, of course, is associated oftentimes with racial profiling. So we're going to start and we're going to talk about some of these. So the first one you'll see up here is called the beasts of prey, right? And these are the concepts. And we're going to show how each of these concepts, beasts of prey, how each of these concepts are evident in both education and in policing, okay? So the first way that we see 
that there's uh, beasts of prey is basically in policing that treats black men as super predators and in schooling that treats black men as threats. So linking black lives and black minds, let's talk about what this looks like. So we know that um, oftentimes black men are viewed in society as being called super predators. That term became famous and became part of the common lexicon in the 1990s. There's a political scientist named John uh, DeLilio, who, is, by the way, is still actively engaged in scholarship and started this whole notion of we have to be fearful of these super predators. And he went to the White House talking about this, and we saw how that became part of the, of the conversation that emerged from the Clinton administration. Let's look at, looking at, not yet, um, Kron, uh, let's look at what he said here. He says, they kill or maim on impulse without any intelligible motive. The buzz of impulsive violence, the vacant stares and smiles, the remorseless eyes, they quite literally have no concept of the future. They place zero value on the lives of their victims, whom they reflexively dehumanize, capable, capable of committing the most heinous acts of physical violence for the most trivial of reasons. Are we talking about people? Or are we talking about animals? Sounds like a lion. It sounds like a lion. And here's the thing. There's a long history in, in black communities of of white communities framing those communities through an animalistic lens. Let's look at how this manifested through a, a quote that came from the conversation that uh, came out of that from Hillary Clinton. Policing, because we have finally gotten more police officers on the street. That was one of the goals that the president had when he pushed the crime bill that was passed in 1994. He promised 100,000 police. We're moving in that direction, but we can see it already makes a difference. Because if we have more police interacting with people, having them on the streets, we can prevent crimes. We can prevent petty crimes from turning into something worse. But we also have to have an organized effort against gangs, just as in a previous generation we had an organized effort against the mob. We need to take these people on. They are often connected to big drug cartels. They are not just gangs of kids anymore. They are often the kinds of kids that are called super predators. No conscience, no empathy. We can talk about why they ended up that way, but first we have to bring them to heel. And the president has asked the FBI to launch a very concerted effort against gangs everywhere. In addition to that, he has appointed a new drug czar. You probably saw him Tuesday night. He's one of the most distinguished uh, active military generals that we have in our country. He's already proven that he knows how to interdict drugs because of his command of the uh, South American uh, activity on behalf of the United States. But General McCaffrey will make a big difference, and I believe it is now time for all of us to know what we can do individually to be part of this anti-crime, anti-gangs, anti-drug effort. The fifth chapter form public affairs programming from the nation's capital and our public service. So it just goes to demonstrate that point. Now, in the work that we do on, on boys and men of color in, in broadly defined, not just focus on black boys and men, but on men of, boys and men of color in general, black, Latino, Southeast Asian, Native American, Pacific Islander men, you see the same types of framing used to describe them. Here's some examples. Um, but before we get to that example, here's how that same language came out into the case of Michael Brown. And this is uh, basically um, a quote that came out of The Guardian. It says, Jones' words recall the way in which uh, Ferguson, Missouri, police officer Darren Wilson, who shot black teenager Michael Brown to death, described uh, perceiving Brown as aggressive and angry and like a demon just moments before he ended the 18-year-old's life. So you'll see on the top left-hand side, right, where we're linking black lives, and now let's link it to black minds. In the work that we do, again, we find that when we talk with educators, when we look at the scholarly literature, it is not uncommon to see these words in terms of describing black boys and men, viewing them as criminals, dangerous, hostile, being combative and deviant, defiant, thugs is very common, overall being very confrontational, aggressive, violent, disruptive, delinquents, gangsters, and troublemakers. And the framing in general is that they are viewed in schools as being apex predators. 
not uncommon for us to see that. We to sit down with educators and hear that exact same language used in terms of describing a young child. So here's a way that it's very common that we see it play out. This is, uh, it's taken from the 90s, but I think it still applies to today. So what they did, basically, they found people who were saying, look at all this conversation about super predators, right? Look at all this conversation that's taking place about super predators. Well, you know what? We have super predators in our schools. And this is a quote from uh, an individual who was a district attorney and was described as being a no-nonsense district attorney, which typically means a racist district attorney, in Philadelphia. And here's the quote. It says, we're talking about boys whose voices have yet to change. We're talking about elementary school youngsters who pack guns instead of lunches. We're talking about kids who, who have absolutely no respect for human life and no sense of the future. In short, we're talking about big trouble that hasn't yet begun to crest. And make no mistake, while the trouble will be greatest in black inner city neighborhoods, other places are also certain to have burgeoning youth crime problems that will spill over into upscale central city districts, inner ring suburbs, and even the rural heartland. Now, in reality, most educators don't overtly ascribe to these things, right? Most educators are very well-meaning people who want to do the right thing. But we're all socialized in the same society that has routinely depicted black men and black boys in this way. So this is what happens, and this is how we see it most commonly in our work, particularly in community colleges. Let's say that this is my classroom, it is my classroom, and let's say that the class has ended, right, and now students are coming up because they wanna have conversations, and I have students who are coming up from all the different directions, and out of maybe my periphery view, I see a black male who approaches me, a tall, um, maybe so let's say dark-skinned black male, right? And he approaches me, and I see him out of the corner of my eye. And my immediate response is to just step back, maybe even just a little bit. Not noticeable maybe even to other people except for the two of us. And then I'm like, oh, man, why did I do that? I'm, I'm a progressive educator. I want to support my students. I want to be positive. So I smile at them, right? That, that's what we typically do is hide these things, right, because we don't know really what to do. So. And that only, by the way, further communicates the fact that we are fearful of them. We put our hands in a very warm and welcoming posture. We say something nice to them. But even in that split moment, we've communicated to them that we fear them. And what we believe in the work that we do is that you cannot teach, you cannot counsel, you cannot advise someone that you fear because it will mar all the micro-level interactions that you have with them. This is Beast of Prey. Here's another way in which we see it. This comes from the work of Daniel Salazano. He says, it's 11 o'clock at night, and all of a sudden, campus police swoops up. There's a total of four or five cars, and, we, and then we have two box uh, cops on the bikes, all here for us, who are not displaying any type of violence or anything like that, but we're upset. And we're saying, at the same time, we're feeling restricted because if we act in a way that we want to, number one, we're going to go to jail. Number two, it's just going to feed into the stereotype that we're supposed to be violent. We actually just stood out there and just really pleaded our case for at least a good 45 minutes. And they're not trying to hear us at all. We had to leave the parking lot. Once again, it reminded me, I'm a black man on a predominantly white campus, being viewed as beasts of prey. Let's look at the next one, what we refer to as a battle zone mentality. A battle zone mentality. Well. If we're dealing with people who are violent, dealing with people who we should be fearful of, then we are not engaging in normal environment. We are engaging a battle zone. And you'll see, uh, if, you, if you Google this term here, warrior mindset, in policing, they talk about having two different mindsets when you approach your work, right? One mindset is having a warrior mindset where you're going into war, you're going to basically give it to the bad guys. I mean, that's what you're there to do versus a guardian mindset where you're there to protect and serve. And make, make no mistake about it. There are good police officers and there's bad police officers, just like there's good educators and bad educators. But in reality, the vast majority of people don't fall into a, a bad designation. They fall into a designation of people who simply don't realize what they're doing because of unconscious bias that they hold. Here's a, a quote from a police officer. He says, we train our police officers to be warriors to be ready to, fight, to face any fight and to engage nearly any threat. Our officers stand on the thin blue line, a battle line we have drawn between law-abiding citizens and the criminals. 
how has that same mindset then, this battle zone mentality played out in educational settings? Think about popular media. When I grew up, there was all kinds of movies on TV and they all had the same exact kind of theme to them. There was a substitute. There was the movie The Principal. Dangerous Minds. I mean, how many movies basically follow, follow along the same kind of pattern where they basically uh, portray communities of colors in a certain way? I refer to this as the substitute effect, right? Because probably the, the one that had the most clear example of this was the movie The Substitute, but I've also had the movie The Principal. Interestingly enough, my twin brother was in the movie The Principal, right? He was the son of a teen mother, right, who was victimized by this school. And Hollywood has long depicted urban schools as war zones and men of color as dangerous adversaries that require school educators and leaders who are willing to engage in battle to save the school from further deterioration. Kron, can you click on the principal? There's actually a clip from the substitute, but I'm not going to show it since we're, we're kind of out of time. Some people think Rick Latimer shouldn't be a teacher. All right, bring him up. Linda, I want you wearing a broader class. Rick, grow up. I'm trying. And now this he's been promoted friend. to the bottom of the barrel, a war zone called Brandell High. His job, principal. Who do you think you are, Dirty Harry or somebody? So you're the new principal. Yes. Hi. Must be the captain of the debating team? No. Come from all over the district. They even come with your own customs and traditions. Burglary, weapons, druids, all them nice things. I want you guys to be comfortable here. I want you to think of the school as a home away from prison. Man, do you know where you are? Haven't you heard what they say about this school? His opposition, everybody. No more gang intimidation, arson, robbery, rape, or whatever the hell you've been majoring in here. No more! You talk too much. Can you tell me uh, what class this is for? Any class Victor Duncan tries to kill me in. This school here is my school. I make the rules. I want these guys put on temporary payroll security guards. We don't need to watch the whole thing. You get the idea. Next theme that we see that plays out in both settings is hypercriminalization. So we know that black men are overexposed to the criminal injustice system. I don't say criminal justice system because oftentimes there's no justice in it. So criminal injustice system. Here's some data from the Pew Foundation on a report that they did that looked at the overrepresentation of, of individuals based upon certain demographics in our prison industry. And we use the term industry purposely because it is an industry. So you'll see here on this chart basically looking at just men who are 18 years of age and older. And you can see that for white men, one in every 106 was exposed to the criminal injustice system. For Hispanic Latino, it was one in 36. And for black men, it was one in 15. Now, this is looking at 18 years and older. But what happens when we start honing in on a very specific band range, and I want you to look at this next slide. This is from that same report. Let's look at, on the far left-hand side, you'll see three band, age bands, 20 to 24, 25 to 29, and 30 to 34. And I want you to look in the center. It's one in every what for black men? Right? I want you to look across all those different categories. Do you see any, any group that has that high of a ratio? Now, you'll see other disparities that emerge, right, in terms of, of the criminalization of, of black women, uh, the criminalization of blacks overall. You'll see some, in different categories and different patterns, but one thing that rings true is this over-criminalization. We see the same thing in schools, this hyper-criminalization. In terms, it's, you know, in the previous slide, it's overexposure to the criminal injustice system. Here, we're talking about overexposure to exclusionary discipline that we see take place in schools. So what you see here are suspension data for children in preschool. This isn't 
high school. This isn't community college. This is suspension data for children in preschool. And you can see here, this is looking at black individuals overall, regardless of gender, that black children account for about 18% of the preschool population, but they account for 42% of those who receive an out-of-school suspension and 48% of those who receive multiple out-of-school suspensions in preschool. Now let's look at K-12 in general. And it's a similar pattern. You can see that black children account for about 16% of the enrollment in, in K-12 education, but they account for 32% of those who receive in-school suspensions, 33% out-of-school suspensions, 42% uh, for multiple out-of-school suspensions, and 34% of those who receive an expulsion. When we talk about exclusionary discipline, what we're talking about are practices that systematically exclude a certain population from a learning experience. Now, there's different ways in which that can take place. It can be an in-school suspension, as you see here. When I was a kid, we referred to these as in-house suspension. Out-of-school suspensions, expulsions, right? These are different ways in which we exclude individuals from learning spaces. Now, this kind of pattern rings true for my own educational experience. I grew up in far northern California in an all-white town. In my school, there were three African Americans, me, my twin brother, and Percy. There were three of us in our whole school. It was lonely. There were three of us. And I remember oftentimes being on the opposite end. Now, here's the thing. We do see that there are differences in terms of, and you'll see in terms of the research, there are differences in terms of, of skin tone. We know that our, our darker black men are more likely to be viewed as aggressive. They're more likely to be viewed as violent. And we know that our lighter skinned black men are more likely to be viewed, still, still criminalized, but viewed as being um, sly, viewed as being sneaky, viewed as being devious in that way, right? So criminalization, but oftentimes plays out differently. Well, when you grow up in an all white town and you're an other, you fit into a category where you can basically encompass both. And in my experience, when I was in fifth grade, I was suspended 42 times. Now that's not 42 days, that's 42 times. My twin brother, he was, it was 24 times. 42 times that I was suspended. And I wasn't, just so you know, like some horrible bad kid. I was, I was an individual who, I had a teacher and if anybody in here has ever had this experience, I had a racist teacher who hated me. There was nothing I could do to make this person happy. There was no, and I had, most, for most of my experience in education, I've had great educators. Great white educators who went out of their way to bring me under the wing, but I had this one teacher where there was nothing I could do. 42 times, if there was anything that happened in class, Luke, get out of here. Go to the principal's office. That was, so that was my experience in school. And so oftentimes when I approach this work, I do so from an emic standpoint, right? This is me search. This is the reason that I do this work because I know what it's like to be in that position, to be viewed from a hyper-criminalized perspective. Let's look at referrals to school arrests. 16% enrollment, right? But black students account for 27% of those who are referred to law enforcement and 31% of school arrests. You getting the idea? Same pattern. Let's talk a little bit differently now. Let's look at our, our students with disabilities. We know that black boys and men are more likely to be, unfortunately, tracked into special education. Now, special education is a very important service and site for those who need it, but only for those who need it, right? And unfortunately, that's not what takes place with our black boys. We're not even gonna talk about that. We're just gonna talk about what does it mean to be criminalized? These are students with disabilities who are subject to a mechanical restraint. That's a, a physical device that prevents them from moving, right? Now, some of you, now, some of you might have seen like a picture where a school got in trouble because they took a, it was actually, I think, a young white boy, young, 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 young Latino boy, and they handcuffed him from here and here with his, with his arms behind his back, right? And they ended up getting in trouble for it, right? 
But think about a mechanical restraint as, re as restraining an actual movement of a child. Now, 19%, they account for black students account for 19% of the enrollment in, in this area, but for 36% of those who are subject to a, a mechanical restraint. It's compelling data. Here's another way in which we see it, and this is where we, how we see it in the community colleges. Overexposure to exclusionary discipline. In, in the community college context, that would be being kicked out of a class, kicked out of a, kicked out of a program. And here's a, um, basically a conversation I had with, uh, with Dr. Harris. It's not uncommon for us to hear from our faculty colleagues at community colleges and men of color themselves that they are kicked out of class for, for small infractions, arriving to, to a few minutes late or disagreeing with a statement in class, and then they're ejected. They don't belong here. They shouldn't be here. So let's look at the next thing. Disregard for youthfulness. This is important for us to keep in mind. If you're from a group that's dehumanized, if you're from a group that is viewed as being different, it then necessarily would follow that your children would be treated as different. They would be viewed as different. And, and there's many ways in which this plays out. This is data from police officers who are part of a large urban police department. And they had 60 officers who were part of the study. And what they did was they presented them with different scenarios um, where they had different suspects. And they had basically these cases that they were able to read about these different suspects. And then there was mis uh, misdemeanor cases and felony cases. And then there's other things that were associated with, the, with this actual um, test. But what they asked them to do was to basically estimate what is the age of the youth who are participating in this behavior. And what you'll see here is that when it came to felony cases, that when they believed that the youth was white, that they underestimated their age by about a year. And when they believed that they were black, they overestimated their age by four to five years. And you can see the same pattern in, in all the other categories, essentially black students being, being viewed, at, or black youth being viewed as being older, right? Basically taking away this notion of them being youth. We see this in other data. This is data of those who are youth who are serving life without the possibility of parole for a nonviolent offense. And if you want, I can give you a um, connection to this report if you'd like to see it. And you can see that black youth account for 60% overall of those who are serving life without the possibility of parole for nonviolent offense as beginning as a youth. We, see, we saw this play out as well in terms of those who are serving life without the possibility of parole for violent offenses or, or the combination of both. And you can see the overall nationally that the black to white ratio and what that looks like is 10.3 to 1. The manifestation of this we also saw in the Trayvon Martin case. George Zimmerman, this is a quote from, for that, that came from this, that trial. George Zimmerman admitted at his 2012 bail hearing that he misjudged Trayvon Martin's age when he killed him. He said, I thought he was a little bit younger than I am, he said, meaning just under 28. The Trayvon was only 17. See, this saw the same thing with the Tamir Rice case. In statements released Tuesday, the two Cleveland police officers involved in the shooting death of 12-year-old Tamir Rice said that they believed the boy was much older than he was and that Tamir reached with the toy weapon tucked in his waistband before when the officers opened fire. This is black lives. Let's look at further examples of this. This is data from our own home state, California looking at youth who are tried as adults. Now, there's different ways in which you can be tried as an adult. So one is what's called a direct file case, where you commit a crime that automatically would necessitate it being transferred in as it, that's automatically we're going to try this as an adult, right, without having a dispositional hearing to view this. Black youth count for 27% of those who are immediately have direct file cases to be tried as adults. Now, there are some cases that then have to go before a hearing to basically determine whether or not a youth can be tried as an adult. 
Black youth account for 24% of those cases. And then what is the manifestation of that is essentially incarceration. What you'll see on this slide on the, far, uh, on the, the chart on the far right hand side of your screen, in the dark gray are those who are convicted. And you can see that essentially 89.6%, 90% of black youth who are tried as an adults are convicted in comparison to 76% of white youth. Let's look at black minds. Same thing, this disregard for youth, this denial of innocence. Here's a, a quote from one of your, your required readings. It's called Boys to Men. It's by Gloria Ladson Billings. And this is what it says. The paradox of black boys' experiences in school and society is that mainstream perceptions of them vacillate between making them babies and making them men. Their childhood evaporates before they are eight or nine years old when teachers and other school officials begin to think of them as men. The once cute boys become problematic men. Here's a study that was conducted that basically looked at what this looks like. And this is what they start out with. They said that black boys and black children are dehumanized. And because they're dehumanized, their children are viewed as much differently. They're not afforded the protections of what a child would have. They're not afforded the protections of childhood. What does that mean? As a child, we let children make mistakes. They're not afforded that opportunity. We let children be viewed as innocent, to be provided with, with protection, to be viewed as being in need of being nurtured. And that, unfortunately, is not what takes place. So they did this study. They took 123 students from a large public university, and they basically, what they did is they gave them descriptions of different scenarios, and then they asked, based upon the child in the scenario, the degree to which they thought that child had innocence or was innocent. And it may be hard to see because of the chart, because I wanted to use the actual chart from the study, but you'll see that they did age bands, 0 to 4, 5 to 9, 10 to 13, and you start to see, you see on the white where it starts to have those stars? What that represents is significance. And basically what they found is that by the time they hit 10 years old, they were viewed as being significantly less innocent than other children. By the time they hit 10, they're no longer children. They are adults. They are beasts of prey. Let's look now at aggressive policing. Use of excessive force. We refer to this as excessive engagement. Excessive engagement. So this is a, a study that was conducted looking at policing. And what they were trying to do is look at police officers. And essentially, it followed a very, very simple design. They had suspects who had guns, and they had suspects who didn't have guns. And the idea is shoot the person who has the gun and don't shoot the person who doesn't have a gun. Pretty simple study, right? Shoot if they have a gun, and don't shoot if what? If they don't have a gun, right? And then they mix it up by having suspects who were black and suspects who were white. And so what do you think they found? Were they more likely to shoot black individuals when they did have a gun or when they didn't have a gun? In both cases. Here's the conclusion. Racial bias in the amount of time needed to correctly determine whether or not to shoot blacks Pers uh, perseveres in a multi-ethnic context. Participants were faster to correctly shoot a black armed target than a white Latino or Asian American target, but slower to correctly not shoot a black unarmed target than a white Latino or, or, un or Asian unarmed target. We also see this in terms of the use of force in other ways, right? That's the use of deadly force. But what about the use of, of other types of force that oftentimes take, takes place? Being, having someone put hands on you, push you into a wall, use handcuffs, draw weapons, push you to the ground, point weapons at you, or use pepper spray. I'm, I'm looking at these and I think about my own experiences and I, could, I can say I've had several of these things happen. Black suspects, and this is a study that came out of New York City, 
and basically was looking at what, what, is, what is the difference between how white suspects and black suspects are treated. Black suspects, they're more likely to use hands, push into the wall, use handcuffs. In fact, every category was overrepresented. Probably not surprising, but it's important for us to say, wait a second, this is black lives, what is black minds? Violent handling, and Tyrone Howard talks about this in his piece, that piece, From Black Lives and Black Minds to Black Minds Matter, right? And he talks about this notion of violent handling, right? It's this same type of notion. And he says this, that oftentimes we find that with the proliferation of school resource officers, police officers, private security guards, um, and I saw this even in my own experience, that some might claim that black students are unfairly targeted by schools in ways, uh, by um, unfairly targeted in schools by school officers in ways that contribute to the start and sustaining of the criminalizing of students. So here's a trigger warning. Please play the clip. That's John C. I heard someone say that happened on this campus. Yes, it did. Was that last year? All right. Here's another example. This morning, police in Rhode Island are investigating a violent confrontation between law enforcement and a high school teenager. Amateur video shows a school resource officer slamming a 14-year-old boy to the ground. It happened Wednesday in Pawtucket. Hundreds of students protested outside the school yesterday. Our Providence affiliate, WPRI, spoke with both boys in the video. Lane Quijano of our digital network, CBSN, shows us what led to this encounter. Elaine, good morning. Good morning. Pawtucket police say the confrontation began when a school resource officer was arresting the teenage student for disorderly conduct. That's when police say the student's older brother allegedly interfered with the arrest and the officer used what the police are calling a takedown. Amateur video shows a Pawtucket police school resource officer at Tolman High School grabbing and throwing 14-year-old Tyler DeBurgo to the ground. Oh, no, you can't do that. Police say Tyler was threatening to fight another student and was throwing punches at a wall, something he denies. I was just angry. I Let's just say, if you hear them talk about what happened, it's clearly not what was taking place. Okay, next theme, order maintenance policing. How does that play out in lives and how does that play out in minds? All right, there's a philosophy in policing, one uh, type of philosophy, it, it, it was particularly um, large in New York and a lot of the urban centers, it's called order maintenance policing. And there's different types of what it looks like, but one is a policy called broken windows policing. So broken windows is this notion that, hey, if, if we let the small things go, right, then big things will occur. So what we're going to do is we're going to police everything. If we see someone selling Lucy cigarettes, we're going to give them a citation. If we see them riding a bike on the sidewalk, we're going to give them a citation. If we see them jaywalk, we're going to give them a citation. If we, if, because if we let small things go, then basically things will spiral out of control. It's the philosophy that has led to a lot of the challenges that we see in communities of color. And it comes from this article by Wilson and Kelling talking about this notion of what's called a broken window policy. If a window in a building is broken and is left unrepaired, all the rest of the windows will soon be broken. This is true in nice neighborhoods as, as in rundown ones. One unrepaired broken window is a signal that no one cares. So it's this idea that if we want to create order, we have to set expectations through signals. And signals is we're not going to let any small thing happen because it'll allow big things to occur. Now, a lot of the challenges that we see in terms of, of cases are a function of a similar kind of policy. So we're going to then uh, give more citations. It's called blue summonsing also, right, to communities of color. So one, it, it's an ineffective policy. But two, what it does is it communicates to a community that they're being targeted, right? And it could create a very negative relationship with police. 
Here's an example of what the outgrowth of that was in Minneapolis, right? So in Minneapolis, they had an order maintenance policing policy, and this is a report that was released in 2015 by the ACLU that basically detailed the destructive nature of broken windows policing. They found that black people were 8.7 times more likely than whites to be arrested for low-level crimes, such as trespassing, disorderly conduct, consuming alcohol in public, and lurking. I say whatever that means. Um, so you can see that they accounted for 19% of the population, but 59% of those who received these low-level arrests. We see the same thing in schools. Now, many schools used to have zero tolerance policies. Now, we're starting to see less schools use these policies, or they have basically reconceptualized them in different ways, but they then still persist. Now, it's the same idea of order maintenance, right? But bring it to a school context. So if we allow small things to happen, then bigger things will occur. So what we're going to do is we're going to discipline everything that takes place as a way of being preventative, right? So here we go. The idea is to create order through uniform application of consequences for predetermined actions, to have zero leeway for small infractions. And then basically what the American Psychological Association did is they basically did a report looking at it. So by the way, they're not huge fans of this policy, right? But this is what they said is the rationale that you see some um, schools use to justify its existence. The swift and certain punishments of zero tolerance have a deterrent effect upon students, thus improving overall student behavior and discipline. It sounds good, but it's not what takes place. Here's another example that we see in terms of the linkages between black lives and black minds. Mandatory minimums. So we know that black individuals are su a subject, unfortunately, more often to mandatory sentencing. We see mandatory minimums in schools. We see it in policing. So here's a quote. It says, scholars have also noted that federal sentencing enhancements, which at a minimum double a federal drug defendant's mandatory minimum sentence and may raise the maximum sentence for 40 years to life without parole if the defendant has two prior qualifying drug convictions in state or federal courts are applied by federal prosecutors in an arbitrary and racially discriminatory manner. And we shouldn't be surprised about that because of all this other context, right? And basically, the U.S. Sentencing Commission has reported that black offenders qualified for the enhancement at higher rates than any other racial group. So more likely to be subject to these mandatory minimums. Here's what that looks like. On the left-hand side, you see a chart for white defendants, and on the right-hand side, you see a chart for black defendants. You see how those bars are equal across the white defendants? That's what we call equity. That's what it should look like for all groups, right? Meaning that relatively to a, a reasonable degree, all the offenders who were offenders are equally distributed as it relates to being convicted of a crime, equally distributed as it relates to being relieved of a mandatory minimum, and equally represented as it relates to being subject to a mandatory minimum at sentencing. That's what equity looks like. You'll notice that that's not what the bars on the right-hand side look like. So for those who were offenders, 20.7% in terms of this study by the U.S. Sentencing Commission, this is using a large set of federal data. But you can see that 31% still were convicted of a crime with a mandatory minimum. A much lower percentage were, of course, relieved of a mandatory minimum. But look how many were subject to a mandatory minimum at sentencing. We can see the same pattern, but in schools. You all getting the point yet? We can see the same pattern in schools. And so what we're seeing here, we're looking at our mandatory minimum suspensions and expulsions, right? Mandatory minimums, oftentimes, of course, they can be applied arbitrarily based upon what is a perceived infraction. So for example, viewing something as being a fight between two, two kids versus viewing something as being assault probably viewed very arbitrarily, but they result in two very different punishments. On the left-hand side, you'll see a policy from the state of Texas. This is a 
a, a mandatory suspension policy for the state of Texas. And you can see that on the left-hand side, it represents a certain type of infraction. And then the resulting response that should take place. If you say something that says OSS, that's out of school suspension. You see ISS, that's in school suspension. You see certain things, there are three day suspensions. Here uh, is another policy that comes on the right hand side. I just took some words from a policy that took place in Rhode Island. Any student found to have committed a violent act shall be subject from school, uh, to suspension from school for at least five days. Any student who repeatedly is substantially disruptive of the educational process or substantially interferes with the teacher's authority over the classroom will be suspended from school for at least five days. Now, when we look at what is the manifestation of this, here's one example that we see, and this is from the Office of Civil Rights, that young black men account for 24% of all mandatory expulsions for men. Do black men rep account for, young black men account for 24% of the population of men in school? Absolutely not. Mandatory minimums in sentencing, mandatory minimums in suspensions and expulsions. Okay, let's take it further. More stringent punishments. I promise this class gets a lot lighter after today. But it's important for us to really see why we're doing and talking about the way, these things in the way that we are. So we know that, uh, that more stringent um, punishments take place as well. And we're looking at this in terms of lengthier terms, right? Lengthier terms in terms of sentencing, lengthier terms in terms of suspensions and expulsions. So on the left-hand side, uh, or on this slide, you'll see data. And this is data from a study that took place in New York. It was conducted by uh, the Department of Justice in, uh, Justice in New York. And basically what they were looking at were individuals who were commit, who were basically accused of committing a crime. And then in this case, you'll see on this slide, this is for misdemeanors. And I, what I want you to focus on is the bar that's orange. This orange bar, what this represents are those who immediately went to jail, right? They weren't released on their own recognizance. They weren't granted bail. These are individuals who immediately went to jail. And what you'll probably notice is that they end up spending more time in jail, even in crimes that they may not have been eventually co uh, convicted of, right? Because what happened, they were more likely to be given that, to go to jail immediately as an option. And so what they said in the study was that uh, this disparity is often due to the fact that black defendants cannot afford to pay, pay bail. The temporary incarceration stigmatizes the, the defendant disrupts family life and employment. It makes it harder for the defendant to prepare defense. This is what it looks like. Notice, look at those orange bars for misdemeanors. Here's those same orange bars when it relates to felonies. You notice that there's a disparity still. Let's look at this in other ways. Here's some data and that comes from the New York Times, their editorial board, and they were basically doing an expose on what takes place in the state of Florida. And they were looking at one particular county that they thought was egregious, Flagler County. And then, here you go, and this is those who were convicted of robbery. And you can see the difference between the white and black differential, right, who basically were basically sentenced for robbery. And basically what you'll see is the difference in terms of numbers of years that they were in prison for the exact same crime. Look at the statewide data, you still see that. But that's looking at robbery. That's probably just one type of crime that we would see that in. We probably wouldn't see that in other crime areas, right? Well, maybe not. We see that in other crime areas as well. And we see the distribution of what that looks like. And basically what they concluded, they called the report, by the way, same crime, more time. They said that blacks were given much longer prison sentences in Florida for whites for felony drug possession involving the same circumstances. And you can see it, how that differential looks like by county. Look at that county. I don't know how to say the name of it. Akikobi? I'm not sure. Okeechobee. Okeechobee? Thank you. Look at the difference there. It's crazy. So more stringent punishments. Let's look at black minds. More stringent punishments. This is a, a study. 
that was conducted um, that was looking at uh, the state of, of North Carolina. And what I've tried to do, if you haven't noticed, I didn't pick all California data. I've been trying to randomly pick different states just to demonstrate that this is a national pattern. So basically what they had was really incredible access to over 5,000 unit records for students in the state of North Carolina across 1,000 schools. And what they were looking at is the extensiveness and intensiveness of suspensions. Extensive means how often. So for example, you can look at for a discipline referral, you'll see that 0.45, that's 45% in comparison to 0.35, that's 35%. So we can understand that. And then intensive means how long. And the differential that you see is based upon the total number of days. And basically, what they concluded is that black students receive stiffer penalties for the same observed behavior, both in terms of it being extensive, how often, and intensive, how long those, uh, those were put into place. Now here is the truly sad piece of this. What, then what they tried to say is, well, let's look at this and let's look at the race of the teacher and let's look at the race of the principal who was involved in this. They, had, they looked at black teachers and black principals and white teachers and white principals. And who do you think was more likely to give an extensive and intensive suspension? How many people think it was the white teachers and white principals? How many people think it was the black teachers and black principals? How many think people think that there was no difference? The answer was there was no statistical difference. <laughs> they, because you know what? We're all socialized in the same society to perceive individuals in the same way. A lot of times people will take an unconscious bias test and they'll find out, even as an African American, wow, I, I failed it. You know why? It's because we're all socialized to see people in the same ways. All right, almost there. Racial profiling. <laughs> so let's look at this in two different ways. We're gonna, these are our last two. Community targeting, right? And then the last one after that will be individual targeting. So let's look at black lives, right? In policing. So in policing, there's a, 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 a philosophy called hotspot policing where basically you look at a map, you look at where crimes are committed, you identify the density patterns of where the most crimes are committed, and then what do you do? You go and you highly police those areas. Why? Let's say that I've come in and I am the new captain or new sheriff or whatever it might be, depending upon the type of law enforcement that I'm in. I'm the new person. And I want to be able to say that because of my leadership, I have substantially reduced crime. And you see that there are certain hot spots. The logical thing that some people might think is, well, you know what I'm going to do? as I'm going to concentrate my resources in that location where there's the most crime taking place because if I can curb crime in that area, I can say that I've reduced overall crime. It makes sense logically, but unfortunately what happens is that you end up targeting communities of color because maybe there's some real crime that's taking place, but also because of biases that we have and dispositions even in terms of how we view the data. So this, if you look on the right hand side, you can see what that looks like. So it's a practice used by the majority of police departments, usually in urban settings, focusing limited resources on a small number of high activity areas. And unfortunately, there's no set standard for identifying and determining crime hotspots. And whenever there is wiggle room, that's where bias can creep in. Here's a, a quote about this. Police organizations that measure performance by numbers and that deploy large numbers of police officers to minority communities to combat hot spots of crime could be accused of racially profiling communities rather than individuals and contributing to disproportionate minority mistreatment, arrest, and confinement. Let's look at how that same pattern plays out in schools. You saw, again, I'm, I keep on referring to Tyron Howard's piece, right? Black lives and black minds. Let's look how this plays out in schools. We know that when we're talking about schools that are low-income schools that there's more likely to be a school resource officer, a police officer, a private security guard that are present. 
if you look here, this is data from the, uh, from the federal government. This is just looking at schools based upon the percentage of students who are, who are on free and reduced lunch. In general, you can see that the pattern is, well, as the bars increase, as there's more students with free and reduced lunch, well, there's more security staff in those schools. But you might say to yourself, well, I mean, but how much different is 41%, 39%, 44 or 45%? doesn't look as bad when we look solely at income. This is what happens when we look at race. This is based upon the percentage of the schools that are percent minority. What do we see? We see hot spot policing. We see hot spot policing in schools as well. Lastly, individual targeting. Stop and frisk. Stop and frisk or stop question and frisk is a practice of stopping, detaining, questioning, and searching suspects for weapons or drugs. It's essentially a license to engage in profiling. The data that you see on your screen are from New York and from the New York Civil Liberties Union. And basically, what they found is that based upon the policy that New York had in place at that time, that 87% of those who were stopped under this policy were black or Latino. They were targeted. We can see another example of individual targeting called driving while black. If you're African American in this room, you could probably say that you've been, that been uh, exp have experienced this. If you're a person of color, you can probably say that you've experienced this. If you've been in a car with a person of color, you can probably say that you've experienced it, right? So you can see this is data from police officers, okay? Now, what's interestingly to, interesting to me here is that this is data that's reported by police officers, and even in the data that's reported directly by the officers themselves, you can see that African Americans were 31% more likely to be pulled over. As reported by police officers. Now, there was a, uh, last year when, when the students who were involved in, in some of these issues, and Terry, you can attest to this, when they were, received the data, right, looking at how are these infractions breaking down, what did you find that was probably the most pervasive pattern? That the data were missing. There was missing data, right? So this is what happens when it's actually reported. What happens when it's not reported? We saw the same thing play out with the Philando Castile case. He was targeted for driving while black. The officer decided the car looked suspicious, wherever the hell that means. He radioed to a nearby squad that he was going to pull it over and check IDs of the driver and passenger. The two occupants just looked like people that were involved in the robbery, he said, casually, according to the police audio obtained by the Star Tribune. The driver looks like one of our suspects just because of the wide, wide no set nose. I couldn't get a good look at the passenger. That's a really good description. By the way, I remember a, a very real experience I had with this. I was sitting in, in, a, in a car in a park. The park had just closed. And in swarms, a whole bunch of like four police cars and a bird over top because I fit the description of a light-skinned black male. I said, well, what's the rest of the description? They said, that's it. And I said, that's it? I spent two hours the night of my, uh, the day, night, the next day I had finals, two hours uh, in the back of a police car with them basically calling me boy, saying all kinds of things, trying to basically get me to act up, right? So that they could basically have a reason to do something. We saw that play out with Flanna Castile. Trigger warning. It's a small picture. Oh, <laughs> 
We can see the same thing that takes place in schools when children are what we call schooling while black. So there's a study that was conducted on, on children. It was a Yale Childhood Center study. And what they were looking at is preschool teachers and they're looking for essentially behaviors in children. And so what they did is they gave them video clips of children children of different ethnic backgrounds, and they said, okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to look at this video clip, and we know that sometimes it's best to identify bad behavior before it starts. So what we're going to look at is, can you identify some of the problem behaviors before they begin? And what they did was they then tracked their eye movements to see where their eyes were going. And what they found is that at the end of the study that the teachers spent more time looking for bad behavior in the black children. Their eye movements were tracking them, looking for the behavior, assuming that it would come from them. Does this mean that they're bad people? No. But they're certainly influenced by bias, and that certainly affects the learning experience of the children. We talked about some of this in terms of a paper that, that, that uh, Frank and I did it was an article that we wrote in um, Huffington Post called Too Smart to Succeed, Too Good to Win, Apply to Black Professionals and Students. And what we talked about is what happens when you outperform low expectations. You then are singled out and assume that you've done something wrong. Here's a quote from a student. And by the way, this is just one quote in the data that we've collected. We have tons of quotes that almost mirror this quote to a T. English has always been my favorite subject, and I've always really enjoyed writing. In my English comp class, we had to write a 10-page essay on a social issue. I wrote mine on police brutality, and the professor accused me of plagiarism. When he handed me back the paper, there was a note on, on mine that said, please come and see me in my office. There was no grade on the paper, so I figured something was up. When I went to see him, he asked, who wrote this paper? I told him I did. He said he didn't believe me because the way I spoke didn't match the writing in the paper. I told him I'd always enjoyed writing and was really good at it. He said he didn't believe me. But since he didn't have proof that I cheated, he will let me go this time, but that I better be careful. We see the same thing with boys being singled out on the schoolyard. It's not uncommon in preschool or kindergarten for two boys to be playing on the schoolyard, and we've socialized our boys to engage in very physically active play and rough play. So you'll have two boys who are playing, they're engaged in some sort of rough play, and then one will basically be lauded for his performance, and one will basically be um, reprimanded for, for being uh, engaging in that rough play, and typically the only difference between the two is their race. Two children, two very different experiences. So, with all this in mind, what is the effect of all this? Well, it certainly feeds the school to prison pipeline, right? And what is that? That's when we basically create experiences that socialize our children to basically go into the prison industry or the criminal injustice system. Socialize them to become, for basically to have regular contact with officers and regular contact with people in authority in ways that basically prepares them to basically be able to go into those systems. Actually, I don't even say typically school to prison pipeline. I usually say school to prison to school pipeline because of my work in community colleges. What we do is we see them on the other end. Mental health outcomes is the, uh, an effect of this, right? Depression, anxiety, issues with belonging and hopelessness. We begin normalizing mistreatment. We create a, an environment where students begin to disassociate with school, and we begin to foster antipathy towards educators and students. So what we need to do is we need to change this paradigm. I've given you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten ways that what takes place in policing is the same thing that takes place in schooling. 
as it relates to criminalization. Remember, today was just on the first D in the D3 effect, distrust. Ten different ways in which the same patterns play out. And I would say this, if, if people who are here, if you don't hear all this and you're not moved, then there's something wrong. And knowing the folks who are in this room, I'm sure that you are. And you probably even were aware of some of this or much of this, but hopefully to see it presented in this way, to show how black lives and black minds are inextricably intertwined, hopefully it moves you to have empathy and to say, you know, we have to do something. So, and of course, we're engaging in checking our biases and holding others accountable for the same thing because this is the manifestation of what happens when we don't do something about it. So, based upon that, what we're going to do is to try to change the paradigm. We want educators, after they're done participating in this course, to view their classrooms, their offices, their schoolyards, their campuses as sites for civil resistance. By teaching that does what? That empowers. And what are we resisting? This is what we're resisting. 